Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 100, woohoo, we're going to answer viewer questions and celebrate a little bit. But first, caution everyone electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. And before we get started with the questions, we're going to run a flash sale. So everything in the store is going to be 15% off till Sunday. All tubes and parts, but excluding the kit amps. There's just not enough margin on the kit amps to run discounts on them. And we're going to have some great deals on some tubes at the end as well. Yeah, so stick around for those. Okay. Well, we've got a lot of questions, so let's just jump in and get it going. Okay, so the first question is from Neil to Charles. I've got boxes upon boxes of TV and radio tubes. What can I use them for in the audio world? Okay, so that's a really great question, Neil. And whenever you're talking about tubes, you have to keep in mind that there were thousands upon thousands of different kinds made over the years. And only a small number of them these days are used for audio. But that doesn't mean that a lot of the ones that were made uh, for TV or radio um, usage aren't suitable for audio use as well. And we've got a couple of great examples here. So if you've been following us on our channel, you'll probably recognize both of these tubes. Here, let's get the questions out of the way here. There you go. So the first one here is the 6P, oh, is the 6P7S. And that is a 6L6 equivalent tube with a top cap. And the 6L6, of course, is a power output tube used in a lot of audio applications. But this tube was originally a TV tube. This was a TV tube. And there's also an American equivalent to it, too. So they're still out there, they're still available, and they're pretty inexpensive. The other one here, this great double top cap tube that we like to use. Oh, I should mention these are both used in our Yuri monoblock uh, pr uh, power amplifier kit. This, <laughs> that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Um, so this is our driver tube in the kit. And these were used for radar during World War II. And basically every major Allied power made a version of this tube. So there's tons of them. And they sound great. No, they were never meant for audio purposes. They were meant for radar, but that's what we're using it for. Yeah, it's a single triode. It's got the weird top caps, but, um, you know, early triodes just sound amazing. I think you've got a Hytron version there. Yeah, that's a Hytron version. And so the point here is that if you just do a bit of digging, you look through your, your pile of miscellaneous radio and TV tubes, check out the data sheets, and see what they're capable of, you'd be surprised how many of them will work in an audio um, audio circuit. And speaking of weird tubes, this is something that you wouldn't use in an audio circuit, but it's still something interesting, and it could have a use. This is called a Decatron, and this is an early display tube. So what these were used for is counting. You would see these lights light up. This is an early computer tube, essentially. And if you wanted to, you could build a circuit that would use this as a display tube in the modern day. So there's lots of interesting stuff that isn't just useful for audio. Okay, next question. Uh, Neil had two questions for us, and this is this is a technical question. We won't. They all won't be technical like this. <laughs> but Neil wants to know why do so many rectifier tubes use a five volt heater? Why not six point three volts or twelve point six volts? It seems needlessly complicated and higher production cost to ha add a 5-volt secondary as well as a 6.3 volt and B plus as well. well. Sure. So on the face of it, it doesn't make sense. Why have a separate heater voltage whenever clearly you can make 6.3 volt filaments? Well, they had a very good reason for it. So first of all, here's a great example of a 5-volt rectifier. This is a 5R4. WGA, great military packed box here. Let's just, let's just take a look at this tube while I tell you a little bit of the reason why it's running 5 volts. So, back in the very early day of tubes, everything ran on DC. We did not have AC 
filament heaters because they were just too noisy. Take so, a look at that guy. So everybody ran batteries. Everybody ran batteries. You had a battery for your filament. You had a battery for your B+, plus, which that's what it stands for, battery plus. So that's a bit of a holdover from those days. And you had a battery for your bias. Look at that. Isn't that just a beautiful sturdy tube? So whenever they managed to make a filament that could run on AC quietly was around the time that all these tubes were using 5 volt filaments. So they simply made a 5 volt uh, AC filament for rectifiers that were now necessary for these circuits if they wanted to rectify AC to DC voltage. The reason why you still see them sticking around is that because you can't have a shared heater tap between your driver and power tubes and your rectifier because what the rectifier does is it takes AC on the heater and then it rectifies AC to DC and it comes back through the heaters because this is a directly heated cathode on these. And you don't want high voltage DC on the heater taps of your driver and power tube. So that's why it stayed separate. So basically you have to have an isolated filament supply. Exactly. You, you can't share it even if it was a 6.3 volt. Right. And there are some rectifiers that have an indirectly heated cathode. They're rare, they're not as common, but you tend to see those uh, also operating on 6.3 volts because then it doesn't matter in that case. Right. Okay, well, thanks for answering that technical question. That was a great question. Thanks, Neil. Okay, next up, from George to Jim. Other than the Freya and the Wilsonton amps, um, what have you liked over the years? Are there amps you don't like? I know the valves are the amplifier. Yep. But the rest of the circuit must have some impact. And yes, the rest of the circuit is important. Um, but up until fairly recently, now I'm, I'm getting on in years, unfortunately, but when I first started in audio, I was just a young teen. Um, and I was solid state. Uh, back then, almost nobody was doing tubes except for perhaps musicians. And even then, I remember my musician friends were all running solid state gear. Um, it was just, you know, in the in the 70s, uh, people thought solid state was uh, be all to end all. Um, it was only later on that I got into tubes, and at that point, I I was interested in building my own equipment. So I haven't tried a lot of commercial tube gear, and frankly, uh, when I compare it to the sound of the kit amps and my prototype amps. My tube tier sounds amazing. Uh, I have no interest in ever buying commercial gear again. And that's really what got me into designing um, prototypes and, and kit amps was the sound just, to, to me, the sound was just so much better than the commercial stuff. Remember, a commercial amp has to appeal to everyone they can, they can find that would even be interested in buying it. Whereas I'm... I'm designing for myself, for my music, my listening tastes, for my, um, I don't compromise. So you'll never find a remote control on one of my amps. It's going to compromise your sound quality. And the list goes on and on of the things I won't put on an amp. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of reasons why we prefer our kits over commercial amps. And basically they're a lot simpler. They're, they're easier to work with and the sound is amazing. So why complicate it? Right. Okay. What's up next? Oh, we got a big long question from Marty to James. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the gist of it is he wants to know, do I prefer a long plate or short plate variant of the ECC 83 12AX7? The ECC 83 is just the European designation for the 12AX7. And he goes on to talk about how how he can't decide which one is better and they both types sound phenomenal I'm gonna I'm not a specialist in the 12AX7 or in the long and short plates and the Telefunkens and the Phillips and the Mullards what I am is mostly a generalist the tubes that that we specialize in the most we know the most in so 6SN7s we know quite a bit about Yep. same goes for the EL34 power tube the other tubes were basically generalists. The only tubes we really 
get a lot of knowledge on are the tubes that we choose for the kit at. Exactly. The ones that we're actively working with, we're, we're able to test all different varieties, we're able to listen to them and roll them ourselves, so we get a good feel for those tubes. But unfortunately, we just can't listen to everything that's out there. And we can't know everything. But the beauty of the internet is that it's filled with good data. It's filled with bad data as well. But there are people out there that make it their life's work to listen to every 12x7 ever made or to specialize, let's say, in the Telefunken 12x7, which is an amazing sounding tube. And there they'll talk about the smooth plate version, uh, they'll talk about the year of production uh, sound-wise. Those blogs and those comments online, yes, take them with a grain of salt, but if you've got somebody who clearly has put a lot of hours into listening to these tubes and investigating the history of them, that's where you're going to find that sort of detail inside of the detail. <laughs> um, and lastly, I want to say something. If the sound of a tube is great to you, even if nobody else online likes it, who cares? That is a great tube to you. And that's the beauty of tubes, the beauty of rolling. Nobody's going to have the same system you're going to have. Nobody's going to have the same room, the same music, or the same ears. So go with what you like best, absolutely. Okay, up next. Oh, we got a whole pile of questions from Jesse. And we'll both answer these because there's just so many of them. Generally, how many hours should I expect to get on vintage power tubes? And then he goes on to say, how many listening hours should I expect on the smaller signal tubes? Well, we can answer both of those together. Okay, so it's going to depend on a lot of different things. Uh, it's going to depend on the tube type. If it was meant to be a, um, a longer lived or mil spec tube, it's going to depend on the system that you're running it in, how often you're running it, and of course... Um, the house voltage. Right. If if you've got, let's say you're running a honking big um, uh, air, air conditioner, you know, window mounted type, and it's it's cycling on and off in the hot weather, it's going to be drawing down the house mains uh, significantly, and it's going to cycle them up and down, up and down. That is not going to uh, be good for your tube gear, your filaments. What what tube gear likes is a nice steady household voltage. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you're talking about different tubes, something like the 6SN7 or 6SL7 should have roughly around a 2000 hour lifespan on the heater. But it can vary quite a bit depending on the tube type. So here's a great example of something with a longer lived filament. This is a Cetron 6384. And what this is, is a 6AR6 equivalent, which is a 6L6 equivalent. And so this is basically the best mil spec, most sturdy built version of a 6L6 ever made. And just take a look at that. The ceramic spacers in here, the extra support posts. This thing was meant to go to war and survive. No, it doesn't have the same pinout, does it? It doesn't have the same pinout. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. But, interestingly, while most other tubes have around a 2,000 hour lifespan on the heater, this is 10,000 hours. Wow. And that's not unusual for mil-spec tubes or really critical tubes, right? Right. And on the other end of things, we've got this little guy. So this is a 6111. Oh, there we go. 6111. And is that called a sub-miniature? It's called a sub-miniature, and you don't see these often. But this is actually a little general purpose dual triode. So kind of a similar purpose to a 6SN7, but in a really tiny bottle. And these guys only have a 500 hour heater lifespan. Oh, there we go. Really neat looking tubes, though. Very, very tiny. Right. Okay. Oh, thanks for that. Um, and what can I expect when either type of tube goes bad? Well... Uh, in the case of power tubes, they can red plate. And what happens when they red plate is that the internal electrical, something has gone wrong and the tube's out of control. And it's basically melting down. And it will melt down parts of your amplifier as well on its way out. So but Don't leave your tube amplifier unattended. Yes, I keep saying that. I never walk away from my equipment uh, other than for a quick visit to the washroom. Um, or to the fridge. <laughs> um, but there's lots of other things that can happen. In 
the probably the most common thing that happens is that the filament just pops. Yeah. Like an old incandescent light bulb, the filament has a certain lifespan and it can just literally die, in which case the tube's dead and it's garbage. But in many, many cases, the filament weakens over a long period of time. Yeah. And you'll see this whenever the filament takes longer for it to warm up and uh, whenever you see lower emissions on the tube itself. It'll just gradually get lower over the lifespan until it eventually gets so low that it won't work in the circuit anymore. And of course, as it's fading away, the tube really doesn't sound up to peak anymore. No, of course not. Uh, and, and I think the last... The last way a tube can die is that it just loses its vacuum. Just loses its vacuum. And you can spot this on tubes that have that silver gettering on them. Actually, let's pull one back out here. Here's that Decatron again. So you can see the silver gettering around the top. Now, if this had lost vacuum, this would turn white. And it's really easy to spot. It'll look like white flaky powder on the inside. At that point, the tube's garbage. You can't do anything with it. And just like the getter, or just like the filament, the the gettering can f and the vacuum can fade slowly or go really uh, fast. It'll grow, go really fast, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, and we got one more question from Jesse. And he says, if you have an extra power tube, what would be your suggestion on keeping them all matched? A rotation, perhaps? Absolutely. You could rotate them. Not that often, but maybe every three, four, five, six months you could rotate them. Uh, often when I, when I ship out a spare tube with a quad, so five tubes, I will have a slightly lower testing tube and I'll mark that spare. And the reason I do that is my guess is that by the time you need the spare, your, your main set, the quad is actually weakened a little bit over time. And now it'll probably be a good match for the spare. If I've done that, you really don't need to rotate. Um... But, you know, you could rotate. There's nothing wrong with that. And if it's a completely a tight-matched quad plus spare, then, yeah, absolutely. You could rotate it every once in a while. You just have to remember to rotate, you know, constantly. You, so you'd have to change out tube 1 and then tube 2 and then tube 3 and then tube 4. I think you'd have to figure out a little rotation schedule. Anyways, that wouldn't be but hard But you to have make. to be careful about wearing down the sockets too much in the pins on these tubes. The more you swap them out, the more you pull them from the sockets, the more those are going to get worn. Yeah, you wouldn't want to rotate more than every couple of months, maybe at the most. Yeah. Okay, next question is from David to Charles. I'd love to know the status of your headphone amplifier kit. Well, you and a bunch of other people, David. So, uh, right now, over on our Melotone Kits channel, we have a new video that's going to be posted at the same time as this one that goes into more detail about our kit. It's going to look at the schematics for our power supply and for the main amplifier and talk about some of the unique features as well as some of the tubes that you can roll in it. And that's the first of many videos that are going to pop up related to the build with hopefully one of the last ones being the first build of the first test kit. Right, and we'll put, um, we'll put a link below so that you can find that. And you've, is it up now? It'll be up as soon as this video is. Wow, okay, wonderful. That's great. And you're going to develop that channel as time goes on. Yep, you're going to be seeing more content over there uh, over time. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks for doing that, Charles. Okay, next question is from Jesse again to James. Um, what, what are your favorite small acoustic ensemble musicians? Now, for anyone that doesn't know, my favorite music is small ensemble acoustic world jazz. That's my thing. Tubes love that, uh, kind of music. They, it's, it's just like they were made for each other. But, unfortunately, 99% of everything that was ever recorded is crap. It's just the way it is. I'm not talking about the musicians. I'm talking about the recording equipment, the mics, the cables, the tape, you the, name it. The mastering. The mastering. Unfortunately, uh, during the heyday of music production in the 60s and 70s, studios were just pumping stuff out as fast as they could. If they got a hit, they got a hit. Um, so what's on my list? Well, number one is Anwar Brahim. He's 
a world jazz musician extraordinaire. His live um, recordings in particular are absolutely stunning. Um, and he's, on, along with um, Keith Jarrett, are on ECM, and pretty much anything on ECM is just, it's worth exploring. ECM is this is a German jazz label that specialized in Euro jazz and world jazz in great musicians that just weren't getting the exposure they deserved by the major labels. And as a result, the uh, the back catalog of ECM is 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 just amazing. If you like um, if you like more modern music, you like small ensemble, you like high quality recordings. Uh, if you enjoy Euro jazz, you're going to love ECM. Uh, what else is on my list here? Um, uh, Kettle Bjornstad. Um, Kettle is just Norwegian for uh, Keith. So Keith Bjornstad, his music's amazing. His recordings are great. Some of them are digital and they sound a bit digital, but the vast majority of his recordings are really quite good. Great clarity. As a jazz musician and composer, he's just outstanding. And he's little known in the West. Um, David Darling's Dark Wood. Cello on Downers is how I like to call it. Uh, David Darling has passed, unfortunately, but he was just an extraordinary composer and cellist. And Dark Wood really pulled together everything he's done. And uh, the Tubes loved the cello, and the cello loved Tubes. I can't say anything. Uh, I can't say anything more than that. It's just you just have to listen to this. It is a mood piece, so it's not going to be for everyone. Nora Jones, especially her live recordings, all of her recordings are really well done, even her first record, which broke her, and um, she's got, she always has superb musicians, and I like her small ensembles, she, she clearly likes, enjoys performing, her, her live stuff in particular really highlight the quality of her music, and there's a lot more, but that just touches on some of my favorite artists. Okay, what's up next? Okay, from Charles to James. How's the GU50 prototype kit amp going? It seems to be taking forever. Charles, is that you? <laughs> That's me, and how is it going? Oh, okay, you're putting me on the spot here. Well, uh, if I remind you, we spent weeks working on the headphone kit amplifier. Yeah, we did, tuning it up, and it sounds great, so... But the GU50 took a back seat for a long time, and I finally got back onto it, and we've changed driver tubes. We had the 14AF7, yep. which sounded really... It sounded really good. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get enough power out of the GU50 with that as the driver. Yeah, it looks like the GU50 needs a bit of current capability from the driver tube, and that's, that's not unusual. So even though it sounded great, we decided to swap out to a different tube. Yeah, so we're, we're working with the 6N6P, which we have worked with before. Mm -hmm. It's a Soviet-era twin triode, and it pushes current. It pushes current, and it also happens to be one of the drivers that you can use in the headphone amp. And it sounds amazing in the headphone amp. It sounds great. So, and it's working out. We've got a, we have a almost fully working circuit. We have some things to debug. It's, it's sounding good, it's, we've got it up to 8 watts RMS, which is roughly where we were headed for when we first started the design work. The clarity is outstanding. Oh, absolutely fantastic. So, we will be talking more about the GU50 as, as we have more to talk about. I mean, I'm working on it every day of the week, so when something significant is ready, we'll talk about it. Okay, so... From Anonymous to Charles or James, what's in the future for Vowels and More and Melatone kits? Well, more kits. So, basically, you've heard about our headphone amp, you've heard about our GU50. Uh, they're actively in development, and hopefully we're going to have them released as kits before too long. But we're also working on a couple of others, and do you want to talk about them? Well, the, the big gap in our lineup is a phono preamp. And the, um, the, the problem is that so many of the commercial phono preamps out there, they just sound so flat and lifeless. Uh, I've got a working prototype that I developed around the Soviet 6S, 6N2P, 
which is essentially a 6 volt 12 AX7. Mm -hmm. And it sounded phenomenal. And that that's going to be one of the prototype phono preamps. We've got another one um, that's going to be using the um, 7F7 tube. Mm -hmm. Which is the Loctal equivalent of the 6SL7. So it'll be a Sylvania tube with that Sylvania house sound, that warm rich sound. And all of this development work that we're doing is for one simple reason. The era in which you can find affordable quality vintage tubes, the common ones like the EL34, the KT88, that era is coming to an end. And in the future you're going to have two basic choices. Well, I have three choices. One, you can spend a fortune on vintage tubes, or you can buy new production equivalents, which is not much of an option because the vast majority of new production tubes sound oh, pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty awful, and many of them aren't even reliable, so forget about that. Vintage is the way to go, but there are lots and lots of lesser known quality vintage tubes that are still available in new old stock. Which plays into that first question about what do you do with all those radio and TV tubes laying around? Well, the answer is build a circuit that uses them and that's what we're trying to do. Yes, and that's going to help harden up your your system, your equipment, so that you can always hopefully for a long time be able to find quality vintage tubes to run them on. Okay, well that was a great bunch of questions from everyone. Thanks a lot to everyone who submitted questions, and let's take a look at some of the deals that we got going. Okay, so, um, first up, Charles, this is the deal you came up with. Yeah, so this was actually a little bit of a surprise for me, and for, for Dad as well. This is the Marconi 6SN7 GTB. With an elevated black T plate. Yep, so it's very similar to the vintage style uh, Sylvania tubes and also uh, similar construction to the uh, the photons, I believe, aren't they? Yeah. And this is a tube that you, you don't see a lot of love for. You don't see a lot of people talking about it, but it's a great sounding tube, as we found whenever I was actually able to roll this in my headphone amplifier. And I made Dad do a blind listen test on it, and he thought it sounded great. Well, we knew it was a great sounding tube, but it has some problems. It has the, the, all that we've been able to find are basically used versions of the tube, which is pretty common. Mm -hmm. It has a high, it has a high failure rate in testing. In testing, yeah. But once it's through testing, they're nice and reliable, so that's not something you'd have to worry about. So we, part of the reason why the price has been so high for used tubes is because it takes so darn long to screen them and get good good setting, good testing, good sounding, low noise, uh, match pairs, but we've got lots of them and I got Charles going on the testing so he's been spending time going through hundreds of these things. And we've already pre-screened and matched many of them for you and so we're going to be offering these at half off. What half off? 50%? 50%. Okay, so um, and we'll hold that until Sunday, I think, at least. Anyways, we'll get mm. that into the store. So if you ever wanted to try a different 6SN7 GTB built basically to the same pattern that the Sylvania Bad Boy, the lower spec GT, was built to, then give these a try. I think you might be surprised at how great they sound. They have that early triode sound. It's got a bit of air on the top. It's a very open sound. Yeah. Think... Um, Early 1950s jazz recordings have that sound, and that's not surprising. Those recordings were all done on tubes, like exactly like this. Of course, they were done with tube mics, tube consoles. Everything was tube based. Even um, the reel to reel would have had uh, tube preamplifiers in them. Okay, so that'll be in the store. Got a Muller deal coming up. Hang on, where is it? Let's just show you. Every once in a while I go through my premium tubes and I look to see, do I have a set that's mm, not a hundred percent, these are very expensive tubes. So there are, I guess the, the lower testing quad I have in stock, they're still perfectly acceptable, but they're just slightly lower than I would like. 
I'm going to put these in the store at half price. There's only going to be one quad. I've done this before. They sell, you know, within <laughs> seconds. <laughs> but if you ever wanted to try a Mullard EL34 XF2 series, then these, these are going to be your chance to jump in at a good price. There's only going to be the one discount, though. Don't apply another code on them. They'll be just in the store at half price and just grab them. You'll see them. If you don't see a listing for a half price Mullard set, then you know they're gone. Okay, and a whole bunch of really neat stuff came in. So hang on, let me go grab it all. We don't want this to run too long, so we'll have to scoot through these as quickly as we can. So, one of the really, one of the best of the vintage EL84s that people really love is the Slovenia version. This happens to be the black paint version. And we got a bunch in, so hopefully I can match up some quads for you. They're not cheap because they're just, they're so expensive to get in in the first place and it takes a lot to match them up. But anyways, these are great tubes. There's a gray plate version as well. I honestly don't know if there's a difference. I, of course, match black to black and gray to gray. A whole bunch of these Photon 6SN7 GTBs came in. This is the early version. These are all from, I think, 63, 64, 65. And they have a really interesting plate getter. Way down low, I don't know if you can see it through the tube. The later saucer getter version, the more common version, it sounds okay, but it's not up to the snuff of the older tubes. In fact, when it comes to tubes, particularly the Soviet tubes, the earlier Soviet tubes almost always sound better than the later version. So a whole bunch of these are in the store. This this is my everyday 6SN7. They're that good. I can't I really can't justify playing premium tubes constantly in my system. So I only play a Slovenia or a Tungsol for special occasions. These I'll run every day. And talking about Sylvanias, a whole bunch of the 6SN7 GTAs came in, and these are new old stock. They're fairly rare tubes. They're not. They're not what I would call uh, cheap tubes. But we've got enough in that we're going to be matching up lots of pairs. They'll be in at the store over the weekend. These are wonderful sounding tubes. They've got that warm, rich Sylvania sound, and they have absolutely excellent detail. And this is the first generation after the famous bad boys with the lower spec that you can't really play in modern amps. So these, the GTAs, have the more, the higher modern spec. And talking about these GTAs, I've got a really neat box. Charles pointed this out. He said, you got to show this box. This is Silver Tone. That's the brand name. It's a rebrand. And that is... Um, Sears Roebuck, who are gone, of course, and Silvertone is just a great brand name. I bet you they sold thousands of tubes just with a name like that. And how often do you see a tube box with a window in it? <laughs> yeah, isn't that cool? Oh, we can't get it out. Let's see, here it comes. And, of course, it's got the Silvertone label, but this is exactly the same two that we just looked at. It's just a rebrand that was very common. And last but not least, we've got some Jan um, 6SL7 GTs. More Slovenias, and this is in a mil-spec box. And do we have a date on it? No, we often we have a date packed, and we don't this time. But these date from the 1940s into the early 50s. See if I can get it out. And these are wonderful sounding 6SL7s. They've got that Sylvania house sound and these early versions, they're really hard to get enough to match up new old stock, new in the box pairs. We've got some in, so hopefully I'll be able to put some in the store. Okay, well that was a lot of fun. If you stay to the end, we've got 15% off all tubes and parts, excluding the kit amps, and the if you use this code, Cheers100, that'll get you into that 15% discount. But it's a flash sale. We're only going to run it 
for the weekend. So today, Saturday, and Sunday, um, Monday morning, it's finished, it's done with. And really, this is a thank you to all of our viewers. You guys have been, and girls, have been great. You've helped make the channel what it is. This is Jim. And Charles. From Bellsmore, signing off from episode 100. Woohoo! <laughs> Take care, everyone. Cheers.